Good afternoon. I'm Rob Satloff, the director of the Washington Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this very special event. It was just about a year ago when the horrible death of Masa Amini, a young Iranian girl of Kurdish origin, um, sparked outrage across Iran and around the world, leading hundreds of thousands, millions of Iranians, Iranian women, Iranian men, Iranians of, of all walks of life to protest against the Iranian regime. Uh, protests that may have started with a focus on the compulsory hijab, but which eventually grew into protests about all aspects of the Islamic Republic. Protests about corruption, protests about mismanagement, protests about egregious use of force against civilians, and eventually, in some quarters, protests about the Islamic Republic's very existence. Um, those protests evolved over the last year. Um, uh, there are still um, uh, important protests going on in Iran today. The regime clearly fears its people. Already, we have seen news reports of the regime cracking down on um, uh, members of Masa Amini's family, as well as activists across the country in anticipation of the year anniversary of her death. We at the Washington Institute are really delighted that we are joined today by Masi al uh, perhaps the most visible outside voice of protest to the Islamic Republic in the world. Uh, Masi al is an Iranian-American journalist, political activist, known for her tireless promotion of women's rights, freedom, democracy in her native land. Uh, she comes from a small village in Iran, was politically active from a young age. Um, she left Iran, she fled Iran, that is, in 2009. Uh, a few years later, she launched My Stealthy Freedom, a Facebook page that invites Iranian women to post pictures of themselves without the chador. During this time, she also started White Wednesdays, um, a peaceful protest against the hijab. Uh, she's had millions of likes, millions of supporters and sympathizers around the world. She's the author of, among other things, The Wind in My Hair. And you'll see, when you see her, you'll know why that's the title of her memoir. My Fight for Freedom in Modern Iran. Um, the Iranian government has taken her so seriously that, and this is a, I, I, I should not say this with a smile on my face, they take her so seriously that they have tried to kill her here in the United States, not once, but multiple times. Um, the Washington Institute was deeply proud to award her with its Scholar Statesman Medal last November in recognition of her own efforts to bring freedom to Iran and of the voice that she has given millions of Iranians in the pursuit of liberty in her country. I'm delighted to welcome Masi al Ajad. Masi, welcome. Oh, you're mute. Don't worry. Here I am. I have a loud voice. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. For I, I'm sorry, I need to break in. There seems to be a connection error. Uh, I just need to do something really quickly. Uh, hopefully, I can fix it. <laughs> there are, is still a, uh, an audience watching, of course, on Zoom, but our YouTube audience has dropped away. Uh, we don't want that to happen. So let's Correct. just take a moment for, for, for this to be resolved. Sure. I can say hi to the audiences while they're watching. Too. Yes. I'm so sorry about this. I don't oh, know what happened. Oh, no, this is not. It's. um. Live event. Um, <laughs> yeah, so many uh, technical issues can happen in live events. So what, while um, uh, while we're fixing this, let me just say a word about logistics. I'm going to invite people to to get into the conversation I'm having with uh, with Masi Al Najad. If you're on Zoom, um, you can send questions to me using the Q and A function on the bottom of your Zoom bar. I'm sure after all these years, you know what that means. Um, um, if you're on another platform 
watching this, for example, on the Institute's website, uh, you can email me directly at rsatloff, that's R-S-A-T-L-O-F-F, at washingtoninstitute.org, and I will do my best to get your questions uh, into our conversation. So, uh, Corey, are we okay to proceed? I'm going to take that as a yes. All right. Uh, no, nope, sorry. One second. It's a strong no. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for holding on for just a moment here. I remember our last event, we had different problem, which had, was worse than this one. Yes, yes, yes. So that was uh, uh, that was a purposeful effort by by uh, by bad guys. Yeah, but you got had, uh, last minute called from the FBI. I mean, <laughs> and you were almost you were about to cancel. Baby. No way, no way. Good to good to hear that. No way, no way. Um, all right, look. Let, let, let's begin. I'm, I'm going to have to put the recording back up on to YouTube later because it's just not reconnecting to the live stream. I'm so sorry. No worries. So we're going to. All right. So, so, but we have people who are on Zoom and who are on the Institute's website, right? Yeah, we do have people on Zoom, though it, the website is what's not connected. All right. So um, we will put this up on our live stream. Everybody will get a chance to see this conversation. Mm -hmm. All right. Now so let's. I will, I will put on my social media as well. Terrific. Thank you, Masi. All right. So, so Masi, cool. let's first of all, welcome. Uh, let's start with the anniversary. Uh, massive crackdown. Um, uh, we've already seen this. What should we expect? What do the people of Iran expect? First of all, I have to say that as we get close to the anniversary of Mahsa Amini, we see that how the Iranian regime is getting more frustrated because they know that people are getting ready to get back to the streets. They know that. Uh, the number of women who actually practice their civil disobedience every day increased. They know that the family members of those victims who got killed, they're not going to give up their fights. And they became the voice of their beloved one. They became the engine of the uh, uh, revolution called Women Life Freedom. So for that, the Islamic Republic, unfortunately, arrested uh, the family members of 50 victims who got killed in the uprising last year. The Islamic Republic even arrested those who were blinded already by the security forces. You see, they're wounded, but unbowed, and that scares the regime. Uh, the journalist who actually interviewed Mahsa Amini's father, Nazila Marufian, got arrested again, and she actually bravely sent an audio message from prison saying that um, I was sexually harassed. But here I am, I'm going on under hunger strike to be the voice of other victims and all the women in my beloved homeland, Iran. So this actually shows you the picture of uh, what's going on in Iran. And it proved that the flame of the revolution is still burning. Absolutely. So, so what do you think we, we can expect um, next week when the anniversary does happen? I believe that people, uh, you know, as I watch their activity, activities within the countries, they're calling on each other, spreading pamphlets around. Uh, in public transportation, you see that how people inviting each other uh, to take back to the streets. So I think that uh, although the family members are being warned not to hold any uh, ceremony with Mahsa Amini's father himself announced that that the the family the family are going actually to have a ceremony to have the uh, anniversary ceremony in the city of Sadez, Kurdistan. But I believe that people across Iran they would take part and uh, they will uh, not only mourn for Mahsa they will celebrate the revolution which the brutal death of Mahsa Amini sparked. And don't forget that the Islamic Republic. Uh, killed more than 700 innocent protesters 
to actually prove the rest of the world that they didn't kill Mahsa Amini. So for that, the anger is still there. Maybe you don't see people in the streets, but the revolution have different phases. And we are now experiencing the different phase of revolution. In many, when you look to the history, many revolutions takes year. But I guess that Iranian people are not going to give up. This is just the beginning of the end. And we will see very soon that the Islamic Republic will be gone. All right, l- l- let's talk about the past year. Um, how should outsiders judge the efforts of the uprising, or as you like to call it, the revolution? How, sh- how should we judge this? You know, um, this is a very unique revolution. First of all, the, the, the main engine of the revolution are women. And the teenagers, young, youth, like 16-year-old, 15-year-old, 17-year-old. So I have to say that this is for the first time in the history that you see how women using their own body, their hair, their you know, identity to risk their lives, take to the streets and tell the clerical regime that we had enough. We don't want a gender apartheid regime. We want to end the religious dictatorship. So in my opinion, the people, unarmed people did everything, everything to bring this regime down. They have one demand, you know, they they, they actually said that clearly and loud that the Islamic Republic is not reformable. Uh, The Islamic Republic is like ISIS with oil. It's like Taliban. They cannot be reformed. So clearly people want regime change. But here we are. The only thing, in my opinion, helped the Islamic Republic to survive, it was not only the crackdown and the brutal uh, oppressing. It was clearly the lack of uh, concrete and strong actions from democratic countries. You may say that you know they did everything, massive condemnations. And that is actually the problem because all we saw was just empty condem- condemnations. But right now that I'm talking to you, uh, all those even politicians who condemn that, they're trying to get back to negotiate with the killers. They're trying to actually get back to having business with the Islamic Republic. Very soon, Islamic Republic leaders will be welcome in Europe, in America, in United Nations. So that is actually the reason that the Islamic Republic see no punishment, no consequence, no, 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 no uh, isolation. So then what is the reason for them to stop oppressing the uprising? What is the reason for the Islamic Republic to stop killings, massacres, executions? That is the only thing that I believe can help the Islamic Republic to survive. So you put a heavy burden of blame and responsibility on as you say, democracies around the world, I assume including the United States, for failure to um, uh, to isolate and punish uh, the the regime and those responsible for for the uh, for the heavy crackdown on um, on the protesters. You know, it's not a heavy blame. It is the reality. Let me be very very clear. America is a land of hope for many nations across the globe. One, we see that um, Europeans hesitate to put the Revolutionary Guards in the terrorist list. That has, they have one reason. I mean, I met with many politicians in Europe and they said that America wants them to have the door of diplomacy open because they don't, now we don't have diplomatic relations with the Islamic Republic of Iran. So Canada doesn't have diplomatic re- relation with Iran. So some countries, uh, must have the embassy open. This is the reason. America could actually call its own allies to do the same that they did. They put the Revolutionary Guards on the terrorist list. Believe me, Revolutionary Guards is, a, is to me, it's more dangerous than Putin for Europeans, in my opinion. Why? Because Revolutionary Guards is, is, is a, the one actually feeding all the terrorist um, you know, organizations in the region. Revolutionary Guards is the one actually, if it was not the Revolutionary Guards, believe me, if it was not the help of Khamenei uh, to Putin, President Zelensky would have won this war 
much earlier. So for that, we don't see any strong action. Even America is now bowing to the hostage taking diplomacy. How? The Islamic Republic knows that taking hostage can be a way to negotiate with the rest of the world, to get money from them, to convince them to bring them to negotiation table. So for this reason, they take dual national citizen hostage and they ask for money. Right now that I'm talking to you, US citizen, UK citizen, German citizen, uh, citizens from Netherlands, France, across Europe, they are in prison. So imagine when the Islamic Republic get the money from the US government to release the dual national citizen, the rest of, uh, you know, um, I mean, the, the, the Islamic Republic will ask the rest of the countries, Euro the Europeans, to do the same. So this is a business for the, for the Islamic Republic. And I'm here to tell you that Iranian people are like hostage in the hand of the regime. My own family were hostage in the half hand of the Iranian regime. They put my brother in prison. We, the people of Iran, we don't bow to the hostage takers. And that is why I believe that the time has come for the democratic country to be as brave as Iranian women, to be as brave as Iranian people, instead of buying the hostage taking diplomacy, just stay strong, be united and isolate the killers. The Islamic Republic only understand one language, language of pressure. So the, the, um, uh, the agreement that, that is being discussed right now, that they're in the, the process of implementing, I'm, I'm hearing you say that this is a, um, uh, uh, this will undermine the revolution, that it will erode the enthusiasm and the and the uh, the energy of the effort against the Islamic Republic. Of course, look, sooner or later, I believe that people of Iran will get rid of the Islamic Republic. But we cannot uh, ignore the reality that how much the democratic country can be, democratic countries and democratic leaders can be a help for the people or can be a help for the regime that is shaking. You know, the Islamic Republic, let me, let me be very honest, is, a, is a, in a very, very serious crisis within the country, in the region. Economic crisis, like women are out of control. Teachers, university professors, those who even backed the Islamic revolution now turned against the Islamic Republic. So we see that the young generation, the teenagers, they're fearless. The Islamic Republic put cameras everywhere by the help of Chinese and Russian uh, technology. They uh, surveillance, they, they actually following unveiled women everywhere they go, shops, public transformations, schools, universities, everywhere to identify unveiled women. But women, teenagers, they are actually uh, shaking the whole regime by facing the cameras and saying that we have nothing to lose. We have one dream to end this gender apartheid regime. So at the same time, you see that the same gender apartheid regime is still being legitimized by the Europeans, by uh, the Americans. And so wh why the Islamic Republic should stop taking more hostages? Why should the Islamic Republic stop raping girls in prison? So that's why I say that hurts the revolution. Think about this. Right now, when America hand out the money and get the dual national citizens hostage, you think that's not going to send a signal to them to go after more Americans? I mean, this is just a simple question. If hostage right. di diplomacy works, then you tell me, why should the Islamic Republic stop taking innocent, uh, like, people of Iran inside the country hostage? And why should the Islamic Republic stop taking dual national citizens hostage? But I have solution. I mean, it's very clear. The US government could have been allowed to warn its own citizens not to travel to Iran because my beloved country, Iran, in their, like under Islamic Republic is not land of tourism anymore. So would, you, would you prefer that the United States take the position that uh... Um, American citizens should not be allowed to use U.S. passports to travel to Iran? Of course, not only the U.S. government, 
I believe that uh, the Europeans, Americans, Canadians must be united, call its own citizens, don't go to Iran. Because as I said, Iran under Islamic Republic is not land of tourism, it's a land of uh, terrorism. And when the US citizens, Canadians, the British citizens, Europeans go to Iran, clearly they're giving opportunity to the Islamic Republic to actually ask money from the Western countries. Right. How they, they're fueling the hostage-taking diplomacy. But instead, they can do another thing. Look, as I always say that, Putin, Xi, Maduro, Khamenei, all the dictators, they have a network, alliance of dictators, autocracy. They know how to help each other, how to back each other, how to support each other uh, through like creating fake information, cyber army, winning the narrative in the West by uh, manipulating mainstream media. They are really good at this. Putin's government, Khamenei's government, they know how to actually uh, lead or mislead the rest of the world by their own narrative. They know how to help each other, uh, to teach each other, to use same tactics to oppress protests inside Iran, people inside uh, you know, the, the, their own countries. But at the same time, they, all, they always help each other to target their own dissidents and opponents abroad on European country, American soil, British soil. I mean, Putin knows how to target people with transnational repression. And this is what the Islamic Republic is good, what China is really good. Venezuelan government are really good. African dictators, Eastern Europe dictators, right. they teach each other. They have a playbook. They help each other. They don't share the, any ideology. You know, a communist like Maduro's government, Putin's government have nothing to do in common with the ideological um, dictators in Iran. But they have some one thing in common. They want to stay, stay in power. Stay in power, absolutely. And that's why they help each other. But the democratic countries, we share the same values. Our common, our common values is democracy, dignity, equality, freedom of expression, freedom of uh, speech. So for these values, we don't see alliance of democratic countries to have a network and to actually announce their policy towards dictatorship. Do we? We don't. So for that, actually, I think we're missing. When the uprising happened in Venezuela, after one year, they actually gained their embassy, uh, the oppositions, and then they lose it. When the uprising happened in Iran, people are hopeful. We're like almost there. We can actually end this regime. And then it's gone. When people are in Hong Kong, everywhere, people, you know, manage to shake the dictators, then at the same time, because there is no uh, united uh, alliance of democratic countries and there is no common policy or uh, collective policy towards this uh, uprising taking place in autocracy, we lose. Yeah. People get killed. So let me ask you about how the last year evolved. Because the way things began is not the way things um, uh, changed over over the last twelve months, and the way things are today. So, talk to us a bit about how things evolved. Um, uh, um, the goals evolving, the the participants evolving, um, the strategy evolving, and where you think the strategy is going. You know, first of all, I want to actually tell you and the audiences not to get me wrong by lack of action from democratic countries uh that's not going to stop people who came to have secular democracy people who dying and risking their lives to have a free iran um honestly the level of uh, like the, the the oppression is very tense you know but at the same time, you see that how like ordinary people became their own leaders in Iran and leading their own community to take back to the streets. 
Like, you know, let me just give you an example. Um, the, the Islamic Republic arrested more than 20,000 innocent protesters last year uprising. You all heard of that, that they sentenced more than 50 of the protesters to death. And they actually executed some of them. One of them was Muhammad Mehdi Karami, a young, amazing, beautiful, brave protester. Guess what happened? His father became a symbol of this revolution. And now they arrested his father. So they first execute your son, then they execute you. And that is why when I say that, um, these are the hope in Iran, like the mother of Irfan Rezaei, she was the one using her own social media, but honestly, mobilizing other mothers to break their silence, telling other mothers that, you know, we have nothing to lose. We lost our children and our children were the pillars of the revolution. Especially like, you know, they execute men because they don't want men to stand alongside women. And bravely men saying this time that this is a revolution, of course, uh, started by women, but we are here alongside our sisters, our mothers, our daughters to end this regime. So for that, you hear that the numbers of men getting executed uh, were, were shocking. But what happened, the family members of these people who got executed, now they have, they changed their strategy. Instead of just mourning, they started to be the voice of their beloved one, to have gathering, to invite each other to speak up. You know, one of the mother actually recently posted on her Instagram uh, page that her teenage son was tortured in prison. And recently, as we got close to the anniversary of Mahsa Amini, the security forces, um, you know, in order to create fear, they showed the videos of torturing this teenager to himself. Mm. I mean, I mean, I'm talking in 21st century, I'm talking about this barbaric regime, getting in touch with the teenager that they freed from prison and showing him the videos of him being tortured. You know what his mother did? She took the social media and she said that you showed this videos to my son to scare him not to go to the street in the anniversary of Mahsa Amini, you're wrong because this time I'm going to take to the street. And he, she, in my opinion, she is the true uh, face of this revolution and many other mothers for justice, many others parent, other parents of those who got killed. These are the ones that they can easily mobilize, big rally. They can, people can sympathize with them. So for that, the Islamic Republic found a new tactic. Before the revolution, they arrested, as I told you, the family members of 50, sorry, 70 uh, uh, protesters who got killed to stop any pot I mean, potential uprising which is going to take place in Iran. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're seeing amazing videos of... Yeah. Uh, uh, women all over the country uh, going without hijab. Yes. Um, and proudly um, walking through streets, through malls, whatever, campus, whatever. Um, how widespread is this in your view? And is the government, is the regime sort of reconciling itself to the idea that a, a certain percentage of women, okay, they'll look the other way or... How is the regime really dealing with this new reality? They don't look out. Now, Rob, let me be very honest with you. The regime is really scared of women. They know that if women can uh, say no to compulsory job, if they remove their compulsory job, this is going to be an end for them. So that is why they are desperate. You know, the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei himself called the police to take a strong actions against those women who uh, practice their civil disobedience. The number increased like massive, uh, like when now you go on social media, you don't see that even well-known actress follow the compulsory job laws. You don't see that well-known athletes follow that. Just today, one of the female engineer received lashes 
just because in a public event, she took off her headscarf and she threw it away. But she, again, she just, you know, used her social media and she started to speak up about this. Yes, the Islamic Republic now understands that, as I always say that, compulsory hijab is not just a small piece of cloth for Iranian. It is the most visible symbol of uh, ISIS, Taliban, Islamic Republic, the, the, the most visible symbol of uh, religious dictatorship. So that is why they're not going to let it go. They're not going to let it go. You go to the shops, the Islamic Republic uh, actually hired, I don't know the statistics, but dozens of uh, like uh, undercover agents are in one subway, one metro. You can see them that they're attacking like unveiled women and telling them, cover yourself. Otherwise, I'm taking photo of you and we'll send it uh, to the morality police or to the security forces to arrest you. The response is shocking. I wish you could so see the video here. One of the women, Parmida Shahbazi, she was being filmed by one of the agents in front of the camera. She was like facing proudly to the camera and saying that I am a woman. You cannot scare me. I'm not going to keep silent anymore. The time that we had the fear inside us is gone. Film me, film me. You know, I still get goosebumps. So, but the, the Islamic Republic, of course, they come up with new, uh, new uh, acts of violence to silence this. First, they come up with new bill in the parliament, backing the gender apartheid policies with more laws, more restrictions. Uh, second of all, un unbelievable. You might get shocked that they come up with the ideas sentencing women to wash dead bodies. So imagine in 21st century woman getting arrested for showing the hair and then the Islamic Republic sentenced them to wash dead body. The response of a woman was beautiful. And uh, the video is on my social media. You can listen to her own voice saying that directly to Khamenei. I rather wash the dead body, not obey your message, not to cover myself. Another act of violence that the Islamic Republic right now uh, actually applied on women is sending them to mental hospital. So women should go to mental hospital and, and, and every week they have to report to the security forces, to the judiciary system that they are actually following the sentence for the crime of walking unveiled. So that is why we, the women and men in Iran, believe that that compulsory veiling became actually uh, one of the main pillars to hold this regime, but the Iranian people went beyond that. They're using this, removing a job in public everywhere, but this is a symbol to say no to whole regime. Mm -hmm. Actually to ask regime change. I know that the Western uh, European, I mean, yeah, Western analysts, Leaders, they don't like the word regime change, but this is what the Iranian people want. So, so let me ask you, what is the theory of regime change? What actually brings down this government, this regime? Um, uh, they've been remarkably adept at using force in the end. I mean, they, 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 they have no reluctance to kill people. Um, uh, sadly, horribly. Um, so what, in your view, is the, is, is the trigger that will bring it down? First of all, look, what can help Iranian people to bring this regime down is just to be recognized by those countries who are still uh, having diplomatic relation with, with these killers. That's very clear. I mean, sometimes I say that in a way that, like, you know, let's, let's put it in that way. What can help the Islamic Republic to survive, to stay in power? Instead of saying that, what can help people to bring this regime down? So, because sometimes, uh, you know, some countries saying that this is internal matter. This is something that lets Iranian people deal with it. We don't want to help them. Then this is the place I always say that, okay, then don't help the killers. Don't help the oppressors. And how are you helping them? It's just very, very clear by not 
calling this regime agenda apartheid. I always want to uh, take the attention of President Biden. I mean, this is this is my dream to sit him down and ask him to watch his own video when he was young. He was the one fighting hard to isolate South Africa because of the apartheid. My question is very simple. If you don't call a regime that kills women for showing hair gender apartheid, then what do you call it? If you don't see the Islamic Republic as a gender apartheid regime while they uh, rape women, while they not allowing women even travel abroad without getting permission from their husband, women are not allowed to go to stadium, women are not allowed to sing, women are totally second class citizens. From the age of seven, you won't exist in Iran. If you say that, I don't want to cover my hair. You won't be able to get an education. You won't be able to get a job, to go to university, to get driving license. As I said, you won't exist in the eyes of Islamic regime if you don't follow the discriminatory laws. So that is why we, the women of Iran, in, alongside women of Afghanistan, we actually launched a campaign with a clear demand to ask all of you, I mean, ordinary people, to help us um, to send our message to the policymakers, to the, you know, uh, those who actually make, make policies in European countries, in US, in Canada, to help us to expand the definition of apartheid and to include gender as well in all international laws. And I don't think this is too much to ask. So, and I believe that if feminist global movement join us, if school girls join us, college, un college girls, university students, if they join us with this specific demand to ask the leaders of uh, Western countries to include gender apartheid on, in all international laws, then we can find a legal way to isolate gender apartheid regime of Iran and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, Massey, revolutions don't tend to move in a straight line. They tend to zig, zag. Um, uh, even if, you know, the, the, the goal remains the same, getting there is not always um, an easy path. Um, what lessons do you think uh, revolutionaries inside Iran have taken away from the past year? What worked? What didn't work? What do they need to do differently in the year ahead? I think they, uh, people year by year, they learned a lot from uprisings. For instance, uh, this time was very unique and people learned that if we have uh, the gathering in different places, rather than taking to one streets and one city, they can actually avoid getting killed. But that doesn't mean that the Islamic Republic are not going to kill people, but it's still people, made it difficult for the Islamic Republic uh, to find them because it was everywhere, like a small gathering, but everywhere, every corner of the countries across the across Iran, more than 100 cities uh, actually took to the street in bloody November. In three days, the Islamic Republic killed uh, 1,500 innocent protesters. So that time I remember that people were desperate to send information like outside Iran. We didn't know even what, what was going on there. Immediately when we had internet, we found out, yes, massacre happened. So this time people learned actually the, the main demand of the, of the people of Iran were like, help us to have a starling, the way that the European countries help people of Ukraine to have a starling, free internet. I'm not saying that uh, we were successful to receive the same amount of starling that uh, the Ukrainians did. But this is what Iranian people learned, that they need to have free internet. They need to be prepared to go to streets. And, for, and I'm telling you, a lot of people actually practicing that if the Iranian regime shut down the internet, what kind of tools that they can use to take back to the streets. They made up their mind. People in Iran, they actually made a clear decision that they don't want this regime. And they're learning from 
their uh, previous uprising, that how this time they can organize to get together less victims, but more victory. And I hope, I hope this is, this is the dream of me and millions of other people, that this time, if people manage to take to the streets and risk their lives, I hope this time we don't hear empty condemnations. We see actions. Look, when we see protests taking place across the globe in European countries, it's all Iranians. Why? This protest against the Islamic Republic have one big goal, to protect democracy from one of the most dangerous regime, which is called the Islamic Republic. Mm. This uprising has one common goal, to actually protect equality, feminism, from one of the most dangerous uh, regime called gender apartheid, because they expand their ideology everywhere, everywhere. Don't think that the Islamic Republic is only gonna kill women of Iran, or Taliban gonna kill just women of Afghanistan. Look, if before September 11, you walk in the street here in America, in New York, and you ask like people to help us to bring Taliban down, people would, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just assuming people might would have said like, this is none of our business. This is their problem. Let's deal with them, them in, within the country. What happened? Taliban, bin Laden killed, more than 3,000 innocent Americans. So I, I'm, I'm very- Became our problem is what you're, is your, what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, mean I, I even get goosebumps to say that, but because of the lack of actions, I see more Islamic Republic agents in Europe now, in Canada, England, everywhere. Well, I so I want to I want to ask you about this. Just what, one one point about, about what you said a moment ago, though. Um, uh, have we have you and the protesters, the up the uh, revolutionaries, have they solved the internet issue? Are we doing enough on this issue to, not, to make not, sure that people have access? Not at all. That is why I think the like uh, senators, congressmen, congresswomen, they can help us actually to ask. Uh, I don't know, the tech companies. First of all, kick out the dictators. I mean, for years and years, we've been shouting this, no result. Dictators are enjoying their freedom on social media while they ban their own people from using social media. So internet is the key it's for, for, for people who wanna uh, take to the streets. No, we don't. And it's still, as I said that, um, just a few numbers of starlings maybe, but people need to have internet to identify each other to organize gathering and as still we were demanding uh, you know elon musk and other who can help us to have free internet mm -hmm. okay um so let me ask you a bit about the situation outside iran um while things were going on inside iran outside there was an effort over the last year to unify the external opposition and it didn't seem to go as well as one would hope. Um, what's the situation? Uh, look, I don't want to put the blame on uh, just the dictators, but let's not avoid that. Dictators are really good to divide their own oppositions for years and years, you know, not just in uh, our case, Iran, everywhere. As I mentioned before, Venezuelan opposition, they were almost there. You know, they've been recognized by the US government, by the Europeans. They had a united opposition. They took the embassy back from Maduro's government. What happened? They are divided. Dictators know how to have their cyber army, how to mislead the oppositions, create fake, you know, uh, fight among them. But I, I'm hopeful. Uh, that people still are united. And when it comes to saying no to Islamic Republic, still the oppositions are united. But the most and important oppositions, in my opinion, are the people of Iran, the family members of those who got killed, those who actually leading the revolution 
within the country, in the streets, facing guns and bullets, believe me, they are still united to say no to Islamic Republic. But at the same time, I believe that we have to more, work more harder because uh, in the West, if we have a united opposition, definitely we can actually force the, de the democratic countries to recognize the revolution and to, to think about the future of an Iran without Islamic Republic. I'm not hopeless. I'm still working like many other activists uh, on the key here to me, unity is the key. And, and I'm, I'm working to, you know, still be united and help other activists and women to be united because together we are stronger, stronger than, than dictators. Absolutely. Um... So let me talk, let me ask you a bit about your own story over the last year. Um, uh, uh, when we did an event last November, um, uh, this was not long after um, attempted assassinations on you in the United States. Um, since then, the uh, the judicial process has begun. Yes. What, what, what's the situation and what, what's your own situation now? How can I answer to this question now? Because still to me sounds weird that as an American Iranian citizen, um, my life is upside down and four people are in prison right now that I'm talking to you, hired by the Islamic Republic trying to kill me on US soil. You know, I have mixed feeling. Same time, but I'm thankful to the law enforcement to stop the kidnapping plot first. Then I'm asking myself a question, how come? After the FBI stopped the kidnapping plot, the Islamic Republic got more encouraged to, go, to send killers, to hire killers. There should be a reason. So I believe that this is just the first step. I am under the protection, but I think, as I always say, the US national security must be protected. And we need to get, no, I mean, the trial, of course, is important. I mean. I really admire the law enforcement activities to actually get the Czech Republic to accept to extradite one of the killers. Because three men who were actually hired by the Islamic Republic, three of them were from uh, Eastern Europe criminal syndicate. They were hired by the regime to do their dirty job on US soil. So they are in prison right now. And I want to invite actually everyone to join the trial because this is not about me. This is about the Iranian regime tried to challenge the U.S. government on U.S. soil. And I want the same day that these criminals are going on trial, you know, Washington Institute, I want Freedom House, I, I want all the human rights organizations, all the policymakers to watch that closely, that how and why in 21st century, Islamic Republic dared to hire killers, assassins, and, and kidnappers on US soil. You know, if we don't take a strong action against this, believe me, the third attempt maybe is going to be successful to get, they can, they might get rid of me, but I'm not scared for my life. That will encourage the Islamic Republic to target more opponents more Americans on American soil. You know, as I said, uh, there is a respectable, respectable, highly respectable, uh, respected uh, human rights organization called um, Burumand Foundation. They actually re released um, a report which shows that the Islamic Republic targeted more than 500 innocent, you know, dissidents, opponent, their own opponents abroad in Europe. So that's, they are not numbers. They are not just the statistics. There were people, they left Iran living freely in Europe or, or they were non-Iranians. They were either the target of assassination plot or they got kidnapped and got executed in Iran. So you see, this is not a new phenomenon. Transnational repression is a tactic that the Islamic Republic always used but we need to have to stop them. We need to be tough on Islamic terror. And, and when does the trial start? 
uh, after January. After January, okay. Um, uh, what? Um, let me. I, I just want to ask you about the future. Um, I mean, the trial is clearly hovering out there, but so what do you see next? What's what do you see next for the effort inside Iran, and what do you see next for the outside effort to gather international support for the people inside Iran? First of all, I have to say that the Islamic Republic took everything away from us. Everything, you know, the right to protest, the right to, to, to have a normal life, the right to even hug our families. They took everything away from us, our homeland, but not hope. We have hope that the future is bright. The future belongs to the young generation that, you know, deserve to have a secular democracy to have a government that separates religious from politics. Religion from politics should be separated. This is the clear demand. And for this, we're fighting. We're, I mean, when I say we definitely, Iranians inside are more like in danger risking their lives. But as far as the Islamic Republic is in power, I wanna say that inside Iran or outside Iran, none of us should feel safe. And that is why we have to see this, this, as a, this as a common battle. And that's why I always express in the word unity and to be united, have a united alliance uh, to support democracy, to expand democracy and fight against autocracy. I think that we need to push for that, to have a global rally, to have a global movement to protect democracy. If we just separate Iranians fight from our own goal in the United States of America, if we say just, you know, what is the women of Afghanistan doing? It's just, you know, uh, something that they have to find the strategy. They have to find uh, tactics and allies within the region to win the battle. We are wrong. So for that, I believe that we have to get together First, to have, as I said, alliance of uh, democratic countries. And another hand, at, at, alongside Gary Kasparov and Leopoldo Lopez, two opposition uh, leaders, activists from Russia to Venezuela, and alongside 52 um, uh, like uh, other autocracy and dictatorship countries, not free country, according to Freedom House. We actually organized uh, a new initiative, which is called World Liberty Congress. And we believe that when the dictators are welcome to go to General Assembly at the United Nations to give a talk and address about uh, freedom, address about peace, this the time has come for the dissidents to have their own General Assembly. The time has come that we, the dissidents, the oppositions of all these autocracy and dictatorship must be united, help each other, make a network and uh, when there is uprising in Iran, when there is uprising in Hong Kong or anywhere, then we have to wake the whole. We have to call the whole world to join us. Otherwise, as I said, people get hurt, get killed, get tortured to death, and we're gonna face more victims in our own country. I think this is what we should do inside Iran or inside Afghanistan, inside countries that they are facing guns and bullets every day. We cannot tell them what to do, but what we can do for them is just to echo their voice and continue their path by mobilizing the world to stand behind democracy fighters, freedom fighters. Masiel and Nishad, thank you. This is such an important message and it's an important moment to give this message. And so I wanna thank you for very much for joining me today for this conversation. That um, means a lot to me. Thank you so much. We're going to um, we're going to post this entire conversation as quickly as we can to overcome the whatever technical problems that we had, uh, because uh, um, I want to join you in trying to get this message out as far and wide as possible. So uh, thank you. Uh, wishing you all success. It's good to see you. Thank, thank you me. so much. I hope very soon our next conversation is going to be in Iran. I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. Bye-bye.